Well, this morning we conclude our sermon series, Headspace, which is all about listening to the voice of Jesus, our good shepherd, rather than listening to the lies that we tell ourselves or the lies that Satan tries to get us to believe. And so as we dive into God's word this morning, I invite you to grab a Bible. We're going to be looking at all kinds of passages. So if you're new to the Bible, the page numbers are written in the bulletin. You can kind of follow along through the bulletin or a Bible that you brought with you or a pew Bible. But this morning, as we dive into God's word so that we can have the voice of Jesus, the good shepherd in our hearts, here's the lie that I want to address, which is the lie where Satan tries to convince us to believe I'm the only one, right? Which is probably a very common thought process that we go through as human beings, where if you're going through something, especially something difficult or something stressful or something that's weighing down on you, how many of you ever felt like, I must be the only person going through something like this, right? Or maybe you just feel like I'm the only person on the planet with this kind of luck, right? That's another way we express it, right? Another way of thinking about it is, I'm all alone, right? That, that when you're going through something hard or there's some kind of suffering or struggle in your life, sometimes we feel isolated and Satan wants us to believe I'm all alone in this, right? I, I'm on my own. I gotta figure it out myself. Now, sometimes alone is good, right? Anybody enjoy alone time? I call it Sunday afternoon. <laughs> I love all of you dearly. <laughs> But I'm an introvert, so this like, this is exhausting, <laughs> you know, like, in a good way, right? I love all of you, but after saying good morning to all of you and spending time with you all, I want to go home and fall asleep in the first quarter of the NFL game. I don't care which one it is, I'm gonna fall, and I'm going to wake up in the fourth quarter of the next game, all right? It's wonderful. It's rejuvenating, right? So sometimes we need alone time, right? You're just a little stressed out. You need a break from people or whatever it might be, and it's good. But what we're talking about this morning is not the, the good alone time. Even Jesus got alone time in the Gospels. What we're talking about this morning, though, is this, this feeling of isolation that Satan wants us to dwell in and to get stuck in, feeling like I'm all alone in this. I'm the only one going through this. No one else understands what it feels like. And the important thing that we've been doing in this sermon series is, is going into God's word. Right? Because Jesus declares himself to be the good shepherd and that we're his sheep. And he says in the gospel of John that, that my sheep hear my voice and they listen to it. They follow me. Right? And Satan has a voice too. And he's very good at tempting us and deceiving us and, and twisting parts of God's word to convince us of these lies, to convince us that, hey, in my struggle, in my sin, my brokenness, my hardships, whatever uh, adjective you want to use, I'm, I'm all alone in this. No one else is going through anything like this. So I'm, I'm on my own to fix it. I'm on my own to get through it. And the good news of God's word is that he promises that, that we're actually never alone. Right? One of the most popular promises that God gives to his people is never will I leave you or forsake you. So as we dive into God's word, we're going to begin with our Old Testament reading in Genesis chapter 16. There's this story of Hagar and Sarai and her name later on gets changed to Sarah. She's the wife of Abram whose name later gets changed to Abraham. And God has made a promise to them. Because they are going through a struggle in their lives. They have a desire to be parents. And then eventually the Bible tells us they got really old. And then Abraham even tells God, when God is telling this promise to Abraham, like, don't worry, I'm going to give you kids and your offspring are going to be as numerous as the stars. When you're like, that's more kids than I asked for. But that's great, God. Wonderful promise, right? And then Abraham's response because he's a great man of faith is, well, that's impossible. Have you seen how old my wife is? Now, how many of you women would love to have your husband say that about you to anybody? Have you seen how old my wife is? Right, that's, that's bad marriage practice there too, right? There's all kinds of problems with Abraham in that scene. But God gives them this promise. No, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna keep this promise to you in a whole year. Neither one of them believes him. So time goes on. 
And isn't that how it usually goes with us? That, okay, there are oh, these, these promises from God that we hear about in Scripture. There's words of encouragement that we give to one another. But when we're feeling like we're all alone or we feel like we're the only ones going through this, what we tend to do is what? Take matters into our own hands, right? Say, well, if I'm all on my own, then guess who's got to figure it out? Guess who's got to solve the problem? Me. So time goes on. Abram and Sarai lose trust in God's plan. They take matters into their own hands. And and the way they solve this problem is really bad. Sarai says, Abram, I want you to have a child with my servant, Hagar. And so he does. And that leads to this scene in Genesis chapter 16 where eventually Sarah becomes jealous of Hagar. And so jealous, in fact, that she wants Abraham to get rid of her. And Abraham says, hey, she belongs to you. She's your servant. You take care of it. And so Sarai, Sarah, pushes Hagar out and sends her off to be all alone. Now, Hagar is an example of really being isolated, right? (laughs) There's really nobody else that she could probably think of that understands what she's going through, right? Doesn't that, like, sometimes that makes it hard when you're going through something difficult, right? Even if someone is saying the right thing to you. Have you ever had that experience where they're saying an encouraging word, they're, they're trying to talk to you and lift you up and and you kind of want to shout back and you regret it later but you want to shout back yeah well you don't know what it's like right anybody ever done that or at least on internally you've had these shouting matches right well you don't know what it's like well that's Hagar well you don't know what it's like like to be treated this way and then to kind of be exiled from all the people you know and to be totally isolated for Hagar this is as lone as it gets, right? She has a claim to this statement, I'm the only one, I'm all alone. And in Genesis chapter 16, an angel shows up, a messenger from the Lord shows up and begins speaking to Hagar and giving her promises that God is going to take care of her and he's gonna provide for her. And what I want you to see is in verse 13, Hagar's response. Because this becomes the comforting word for us that even if we get into an extreme situation like Hagar, we feel, I really am the only one. I don't know if another human being going through the junk that I'm going through, right? Or struggle with what I'm struggling with. Here's what happens in verse 13. So she, that is Hagar, called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. This is the only time in your Bible where a human being names God. All the other times he names himself or reveals his own name. And so she's completely isolated. She's been abandoned by all the people that she knows. She really does feel like what? I'm the only one. No one understands. I'm totally alone in this. And in the midst of that, God shows up. And speaks to her, makes a promise to her. And this is how she sees God. You are a God of seeing. The Hebrew name is El Roy. So E-L-R-O-I. El Roy. And it literally means not just the God of seeing. Because I need you to be honest with me. Usually on most Sundays I want you to be honest with me. Okay. And especially right now. How many of you have felt like Hagar, where you're totally isolated, you're feeling a little overwhelmed, nobody gets it, right? And then somebody quotes a Bible passage to you to encourage you. Anybody ever been through that? Or like someone came along and here's here's a Bible passage and you're a believer, right? So you're like, hey, the Bible's good, right? God's promises are good. If I just asked you in a vacuum, how many of you think the Bible's good? How many of you agree with me? You're like, Okay, the rest of you, I'll keep preaching, okay? How many of you think the promises of God are good and comforting, right? But let's be honest. Sometimes when you feel like Hagar and and Satan's got his claws and you feel like I'm the only one, nobody understands, nobody cares, nobody gets it. Guess what happens when you hear those promises? We say, that sounds great, but I don't think they're for me, right? 
I don't think that was meant for me. That might, be, that might work for other people. That might be for other people, <clears throat> but it's not for me. And this is very important. When she says, you are a God of seeing. You are El Roy. You can, be, you can be pretty negative. You can say, oh, that's good. He's seeing other people's <laughs> stuff. He's seeing what's going on over there, but it doesn't feel like what? He, he's seeing what's going on here. And here's the importance of why I'm telling you, El Roy, the, the literal translation is, you are the God who sees me. That's what the name literally means. He's not just the God of general seeing of, of the problems over there and the, and the good people over here that he cares about and I'm just over here all alone. What Hagar is saying is in the midst of this, you are the God who not just sees what's going on with Abram and Sarah and their problems, but you even see Hagar, you even see me. Now here's the good news, it's not just that he sees. Because on the one hand, that's comforting, right? Hey, God sees me. He understands what's happening. But here's how Satan continues to work to get us to doubt the promises of God, the goodness of God, to think, no, no, that's great. He sees me. So when's he going to do something? Anybody ever had that argument with God, that debate with God, that struggle, right? Oh, that's wonderful. You see what's going on? When are you going to step in, right? When, when, you know, reach down with that mighty hand we always hear about and do something, right? That's the next way that Satan reaches in. But here is the promise from God. In verse 13, for she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. So it's not just that God sees. It's not just that God sees me, but Hagar is saying, here's his promise. Here's the goodness of God. He also looks after me. He's not just going to be like, wow, that's tough, right? Have you ever said that to a friend because you were just at a loss for words and you meant well, but you're just like, they're going through something. You're like, well, that sounds difficult. That sounds tough. Anybody? Am I the only one? Like, I've done this as a pastor because I'm not perfect and I don't have all the answers, right? Sometimes you're just like, wow, that is painful. That is hard, right? That's not what God does, though. He doesn't just see you and go, whew, I'll pray for you. I'll help you figure it out. No, Hagar is saying, no, he's also the God who looks after me. And here's the good news of how do I know God actually looks after me and, and pursues me? And the answer that you've learned, most answers in church and Sunday school is going to be Jesus. Because he's not just a God who sees, he's a God who looks after us, which is the whole point of the incarnation. He didn't stay absent and far away from the struggles and sins and brokenness of humanity and our own lives. No, he said, what? I'm going to come down to you. I'm going to take on flesh. I'm going to become a human being just like you and live and die for you. So if you ever wondered and and Satan's battling against you, like, where's the proof that God sees me and that God looks after me and that he's with me in this. And the answer is, well, I have Jesus. I have the Christmas story. I have Good Friday. I have Easter. I have the Jesus who came to be with us. There's a story that uh, Susan Howatt, she wrote a whole uh, novel series uh, called Starbridge series. And it's about faith and church and, and they're novels, but they're kind of meant to reveal some of the wrestling matches that we go through in life. And in the final novel of this series, there's a, a bishop who's the main character. His name is Charles, which I don't like because that's my middle name and I hate my middle name, right? But his name is Charles and he's a bishop in the church. And he always has this attitude of having all the answers. Have you ever met someone like this? Yeah, they're fun to be around, aren't they? (laughs) Now here's what happens with the people that think they have all the answers, especially the people that think they have all the answers about God and faith and life, is they don't. We just think we do sometimes, right? We think if I was in charge, if I do this, right? And it's just amazing how suffering has a way of humbling us, right? And going, maybe I don't know as much as I thought, right? So this Bishop Charles, he's so pompous, he's so arrogant, eventually has his whole world turned upside down when his wife, Lyle, dies. And he doesn't know what to do anymore. 
because he's he doesn't know like well is god good and, and what's happening and why would this be allowed to happen and isn't god going to act and isn't god going to see and do something right so all the kinds of questions that we would ask right that we often ask and so he sits down on a park bench next to somebody and this stranger begins this conversation says isn't life bloody sometimes she's british so it's life bloody sometimes and the bishop says yes and the man on the bench says are you just saying that to be nice to me and the bishop says no he really agrees and the man on the bench says thank god this is an odd conversation to be having with a bishop i can relate to that and people are like well, this is weird to have pastor conversation excuse me why i just pinched myself to make sure i'm not dreaming and bishop charles replied it's no dream it's good to meet someone else who's gone through hell lately. Isn't it wonderful? It makes all the difference to know there's someone else screaming alongside you. And that's the point of the incarnation. God came into the world and screamed alongside us. Sometimes suffering happens. I, I'm not blowing your minds by saying that. And things happen that we don't understand. We can't put into a nice neat box. We can't explain. We want to just scream, right? We just want to shout out like, what's going on? Why would this happen? How could God allow it? When is he going to do something? And what Satan wants you and I to believe in those moments is you're all alone. You're the only one who feels that way. You're the only one who's been through something like that. And what God's word shouts back is this wonderful promise that you are the God who sees me and looks after me. And not only that, you are Emmanuel. You are the God who is with us. You are the God who took on flesh and suffered and died just like we have. And this is the comforting good news of God's word is saying, hey, no matter what, we're not actually alone. We're not the only ones who understand this or go through this kind of thing. God himself understands because of who Jesus is and what the cross is like. In Hebrews chapter 4, in our epistle reading, there's this wonderful statement about who Jesus is in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. To the good news of Jesus being God with us. The good news of the incarnation is that Jesus is able to sit with you, scream alongside you in your suffering and go, I know what it's like. Right? There, there might be other people, they don't totally get it. They care about you. They love you. They encourage you. They haven't, right? Sometimes if you, you just feel that pull where it's like, you know, if you haven't been through exactly what I've been through, it's hard for me to trust that you understand fully, right? And yet... What the word of God is declaring is, hey, we have this high priest. We have Jesus. And he's not absent. And he's not far away. And he's not just, you know, oh, well, he did the perfect life. And isn't that great? Look at Jesus. He's saying, no, we have a Jesus who took on flesh and blood. Who's able to sympathize with all of our weaknesses. How many of you got some weaknesses? <laughs> or how many of you just feel weak sometimes? Because you're like, I'm beat up, man. I'm tired. I feel weak. What we're saying is, yeah, and in Jesus, you and I have a high priest, we have a savior, we have a God who's able to sympathize no matter what our weakness is, no matter what our struggle is, no matter what our temptation is. And more than that, we don't just have a Jesus who screams alongside us as comforting as that is. We, we also have a Jesus who gives us victory over all those weaknesses. That's why it says, yeah, he, he did all this, but he did it without sin. And that's why verse 16 is so important. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Hey, sometimes when you feel all alone, when Satan's got his grips on you and has convinced you, you're the only one, you're all alone, and you feel totally isolated, you also begin to want feel isolated from God. Right? Oh, I'm not good enough. He doesn't want me. I've messed up. I got way too many weaknesses. 
Yet what the word of God says is because of Jesus, you and I can walk up with confidence. I love that word, right? Anybody ever feel not confident in life, right? Every time I ask someone to speak publicly, they're like, no, pastor, no more confidence, right? <laughs> right? I, right? We all got weaknesses. There's things where it's like it happens and you're not confident anymore. So some of you know this about me. I hate being in front of groups of people with a huge passion. Gut and I talk about this regularly, all right? <laughs> I, I just can't do it. And here's, what I, here's proof of this. I've been in numerous plays in my life. When I was in middle school, I took a drama class because I didn't know what extracurricular activity I was going to do. And I didn't know an instrument, so I couldn't join band. I was like four feet tall and slow, so they're like, you're not gonna make any of the sports teams. And I was like, all right, I'll act. And that's when I discovered, I don't wanna be in front of people ever, ever again for the rest of my life. I couldn't get any of my lines out, right? Anybody ever had this struggle of being in front of a group of people and you're like, all of your confidence in the whole world is what? It's gone like that, right? I got a D minus in drama. <laughs> Really, really did not help the old GPA there. <laughs> I should have got an F, but my teacher felt pity for me. It was like, you stood in front of the group, you tried, right? And I'm talking like, words would not come out. And all that would happen is I, I would blush. And I know some of you, anybody else have this blushing problem? I mean, I looked like a strawberry. Okay, there's just no, like, it was just all the blood in my body went into my face. It was like, say your line. I don't got, I don't know a line. It's, not, it's over. See, that's what a lack of confidence will do. You're like, I don't want to do this ever again. This is not the place I belong. I realized very quickly, I was like, I don't, I don't belong here, right? And that's what Satan wants you to feel like. You are so weak. You are so frail. You've got so many problems. You don't belong here. You should just go be alone. You should just stay by yourself. And the whole promise of the gospel is actually what God's word says, which is let us with confidence, where I just walk in there and be like, this is my home. This is where I belong. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> I do got some weaknesses I'm bringing with me. I got some baggage. I got some problems. But this is where I belong because he's my dad and I'm his child. And here's why we go to that throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Right? Hagar had a huge time of need. It was totally isolated and alone, felt like I'm the only one. And that's where God met her and said, you're not alone. I'm the God who sees you. I'm the God who looks after you. And you and I, we may be struggling, and you may have some secret sins that you never want to confess to another human being. Whatever it might be that Satan has worked on you to try to convince you, you are alone, you are the only one, you should stay by yourself. God's invitation to the gospel is to say, no, you can show up here because this is your house. This is where you belong. This is your family. And we go there, what I love is, in our time of need, not just when you got it all figured out, right? How many of you pray more often when you're in your weaknesses than when you should be saying prayers of thanksgiving? Anybody have this? I have this. Bible's like, pray all the time and give thanks to God. I'm like, that's a cool idea. Dear Lord, please help me is more frequently my prayer. Anybody else on that list? Yeah. Here's the good news. God's word says, no, you, you come to the throne of grace and receive his mercy, receive his love, his forgiveness, his grace. Not when you've all, you got it all figured out and you're feeling confident and good about yourself and saying, yeah, I'm, all, I'm awesome. What does it say? It says, I get help in what? My time of need. I go, I do feel alone. Hey, right now I feel like I'm the only one struggling with this. Sometimes it feels like, hey, Lord, if these people that love me knew about this sin, I don't think anybody would love me anymore. And the invitation of the gospel is Jesus is your high priest who invites you to receive his grace and mercy in your time of need. 
So that's Jesus for us. And here's the other way that God has worked to help you and I fight back against those lies of Satan and to help others, right? So the two greatest commandments in the Bible, according to Jesus, are to love God and then what? Love people, love your neighbor, right? So how do we do that when people are feeling all alone? One of the answers is that God gave you and me the church. Now it's a mess, <laughs> okay? Because they're, they're sinners in the church, if you haven't figured that part out yet. They're sitting right next to you. Look at them, stare at them, be like, oh, I can't believe you're here, all right? They're gonna do the same thing to you. <laughs> like, oh, oh wow, we're, we all made it, this is amazing. But I'm serious, this, this is what God has done. He says, here's how I'm gonna help you here and now fight back against the lies of Satan, which is, you are not alone, you have the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, is a very famous verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says it this way. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to humanity. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Right, so many of you have probably heard this Bible verse, right? You're like, no, there's no temptation. It's not common to humanity. So that's comforting. It means, guess what? You're not the only one struggling. Right? Seriously, take a moment to look around at all the other sinners in this room and realize, oh, okay, I'm not the only one. We all have issues. We all have sin. We are all in need of the grace of Jesus. And that sounds great. And then Paul goes on. He says, and, and he's going to give you a way of escape, right? He's going to give you a way out of the temptation. How many of you have heard this Bible verse before and thought, I didn't find the way of escape because I dove head first into that temptation and it became full on sin. Anybody ever done that? We were just like, oh, I was supposed to escape that and I didn't. It caught me, right? So sometimes this verse sounds wonderful. Like, oh, he's gonna give you an escape. God, he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Sometimes it's translated beyond your strength. Anybody ever been felt weak in your temptations then? And you're like, wow, I'm supposed to be like, God says I'm not gonna get anything beyond my strength, beyond my abilities. How many of you have ever just felt overwhelmed and thought Paul was lying? Right, you're just like, hey, Paul, I'm, I'm being overwhelmed here, right? Like, I'm being tempted, I'm sinning, I can't find the escape hatch. Anybody? Am I the only one? Thank you for making me feel so lonely up here in my box. All right. Here's the deal, I've told you this before. We need a Bible that uses the word y'all. We need a Bible that uses the phrase all y'all. Because this verse, and one of the things that Satan loves to do, is he loves to use half-truths. He loves to misquote scripture. If you see the way he tempts people in the Bible, he's always half quoting scripture or half quoting things God has said to trick us and deceive us. And I've seen a lot of people be deceived by Satan because of a misquoting and misunderstanding of this verse, which makes it sound like, well, in order to overcome my sin, in order to overcome it, I just need to be better, right? I just need to be stronger because it says God won't test me beyond what, what? My strength, my ability. But here's the importance of the church, right? Of not believing Satan's lie that you're all alone, you've got to figure it out, you've got to be strong on your own, is this whole verse is plural. It's not you individually. God is faithful and he will not let y'all be tempted beyond all y'all's ability and strength. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that all y'all may be able to endure it. The whole point is God saying, I gave you each other. I gave you the church so that you would be able to remind each other you are not alone. You are not the only one. We're in this together. Oh, you might be struggling with that. Well, I've got these struggles. We can pray for each other. We can remind each other of God's grace and forgiveness in Jesus. And we can build each other up and remind each other, Satan's a liar. You're not the only one. You're not alone. You don't have to struggle on your own. We're here for each other. 
I asked you just a moment ago, what are the two greatest commandments? Love God and love your neighbor. One of the greatest and most powerful ways you could love your brothers and sisters in Christ is to remind them, you're not alone. You are not the only one. I'm a sinner too. <laughs> I'm being tempted too. And together, we can pray for each other, encourage each other, and remind each other of who Jesus is. This is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus is God with you in all of it, screaming alongside you. He knows everything that you've been able to go through, he has gone through. He understands what your pain and suffering is like. And the good news is he has given you victory over all that sin and death and suffering. And in the meantime, he's given us each other. He's given us the church to remind each other we're not alone in life. We're not alone in our temptations and our struggles. And he's given us each other to remind one another Jesus is with you. Jesus loves you and forgives you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are Emmanuel, that you are God with us. You are the God who sees me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace and mercy in our times of weakness and sin and temptation. Thank you for constantly forgiving us and redeeming us and renewing us. Lord Jesus, make us a people who love one another by reminding each other of the truths of your word and promise that we are not alone, that we are not the only ones, and that you love and forgive each and every single one of us. In your name we pray, amen.